Welcome. My name is Amon Chandel, and I am Head of Events at Women in Mining UK. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our second event of the year, very kindly supported by Buchanan. So before we officially start, I would like to run through the usual housekeeping points. Please note, we are recording today's event. If you could be so kind to keep your mics on mute during the panel discussion, that would be greatly appreciated. Your cameras have been turned off, but please feel free to switch them on at any time. We will be taking questions from our audience via the chat button at the bottom of your screen. And WIM events volunteer Amy Donlevy is in the background and will make sure we receive all your questions. We will also have the usual breakaway rooms and give you the opportunity to network with your fellow attendees. If you've not had a chance to participate in any of these networking breakout rooms, I'll be sharing further details shortly. In the meantime, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our moderator today, Ariadna Perez, who has been responsible for organizing today's panel discussion. Ariadna, thank you again for volunteering your time and expertise. I will hand over to you now to start us off. Thanks, Damon. Hi, good afternoon. I am Ariadna, um, Head of Communications at Women in Mining UK. I am also a director at Buchanan, which is sponsoring today's event. Buchanan is a financial communications agency. We do a fair bit in the mining space, and we see the value in taking an integrated approach to ESG risks and opportunities as they relate to managing and communicating a company's investment proposition. So again, Thank you for joining us today for the discussion. Before we get started with the panel and introductions of our panelists, we're going to do a poll question. I'll hand it back to Amon for that. Right, you should all be seeing the poll question come up on your screen now. I'm going to read it out. On a scale of one to five, how much do consumers care about sustainable metals? with one being they don't care, and five being they care a lot. And you should now see the poll results. Okay, thank you for that, everyone. The reason I chose this question is um, even though I think this topic is very important, I'm also a very skeptical person. And so I wasn't really sure where we are on the, the spectrum, um, but yes, very interesting. We're basically in the middle, 41% uh, decided that it's a three. So I guess that's, yeah, average. Thanks for that. Okay, um, so let's get started. My first question is for Michelle and Charlie, both who run organizations that give companies and consumers peace of mind um, about, in Michelle's case, responsible production and working towards the SDGs, and in Charlie's case, quality and responsible sourcing. Please, can you both introduce yourselves and your organizations and give us an overview on what was the impetus to found them and what are your overall goals? Let's start with Michelle. Thanks so much. Um, hi, everyone. Good day. It's a pleasure to be in this panel and, and in this discussion here today. My name is Michelle Brillhart. I'm the executive director of the Coppermark, which is a relatively young organization. The Coppermark is an assurance framework. We look to promote responsible production practices of copper and to demonstrate the copper industry's contribution to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The, the reasoning behind it is really simple. Copper is an essential material for the transition to the clean energy. Um, and so we want to make sure that this raw material is responsibly produced. So that means both mitigating any negative impacts on the environment, on human rights and social and governance issues, as well as increasing positive contributions that the industry can do to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Initially, we were developed by the copper industry, but with the recognition that for a undertaking such as this to be recognized by consumers and customers, it needed to be independent of the industry. So since last year, we've been uh, incorporated as a separate organization with a separate board, and we have made a commitment to have a fully independent board of directors by the end of this year. In terms of what are the drivers and what's the origin of the copper mark, it's really the recognition that responsible practices today are not a, a nice to have anymore. 
it's an expectation. It's necessary for companies to retain their access to capital, retain their license to sell, retain their license to operate. So it's really become a, a requirement and a way to do business, a way to produce minerals and metals in, in many ways. Similarly, we saw a lot of customers want to understand where the raw materials are coming from. So they're trying to decarbonize their own supply chains. They're trying to understand or comply with expectations and human rights due diligence, um, regulations that are coming up on human rights due diligence. And the first step they need to take is really just to understand where the materials are coming from and what the kinds of risks are associated with their production. And so that's where organizations like the Copper Mark come in. We look to set shared expectations. So what does it mean to be a responsible producer? What are the requirements? We verify that companies indeed actually implement those um, practices. So it's not just a, a paper in the standard and, and lots of jargon and acronyms, but it's really translated into practice. And we help producers communicate about their practices in a way that is easily recognizable by a wide variety of their customers, of their investors, and sometimes even regulators. Hello, um, thanks for having me. I'm Charlie Betts. I'm the managing director of the Betts Group, which is the um, oldest refinery and um, manufacturer in the UK of precious metals. We predominantly service the, the jewelry industry, but we deal with other industries as well. Um, and I also uh, founded Single Mine Origin in conjunction with Hummingbird Resources, which is a West African mining corporate. Um, the reason we established Single Mine Origin was, was twofold, really. Um, partly it was looking from the, from the mining industry perspective and, and addressing what I think is a, a misconception that mining is sort of a, a big corporate evil and actually having witnessed firsthand the development of um, both Hummingbird's mine in Yanfali Lamali, but also others. Actually, I think um, a well-run corporate mine can be a force for good and can have um, really quite impressively progressive practices in terms of ESG compared to a lot of other industries. Um, but then the, from my personal perspective, the drivers for setting up single mine origin came from the jewellery industry. So what we're doing is we're providing metal that can be traced directly to a responsibly run source. And we're defining that responsibility as a mine that's run within the World Gold Council's responsible gold mining principles. Um, and you know, the, the question at the start was really interesting because it is absolutely undeniable in my point of view that there is a huge growth in awareness from consumers and engagement with the provenance of the products that they're buying. And we're, we're struggling you know, we have over the recent years struggled to find products that satisfy that, that demand for engagement with the supply chain, which is exactly what we're now trying to provide. Great, thank you. Um, so moving on to our other two panelists, uh, Michele and Yulia are representing the corporate side of mining. Michele, um, in my first call with Yulia, we were discussing your participation um, and your work at Tracer. Um, and Yulia reminded me that consumer interest in the mining supply chain really shot to the forefront with the movie Blood Diamond. Um, this was obviously before your time, but um, I'm sure it's had a hand in why Tracer exists today. Uh, please, can you introduce yourself and share De Beer's rationale uh, about when it decided not to fight but embrace what consumers were worried about? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good evening and, and good morning to everyone who's tuned into um, the session today. And just a big thank you to the Women in Mining as well for inviting me to join this wonderful panel. Uh, my name is Michele Brown. I started working in Anglo-American's technical and sustainability division in the start of my career. Um, thereafter moved on to their international and government relations division, where I focused on key policy areas such as human rights, climate change, as well as the ethical value chain. Um, in my most previous role, I formed part of the core team that was leading Tracer, um, a De Beers initiated connected value chain platform that uses blockchain, artificial intelligence, and the internet of things to trace individual diamonds from the country of origin all the way to the end consumer. Um, as I sit here today, I was recently appointed to lead all the corporate, government, and international relations 
for hydrogen within Anglo-American. Um, just to backtrack regarding your question around De Beers and their rationale for initiating the successful development of Tracer. Um, firstly, Tracer's entire purpose is to enhance consumer trust in the industry by ensuring provenance, traceability, and authenticity in natural diamonds from De Beers mines. Um, this is done by creating unique digital assets that represent each diamond on the Tracer platform itself. Now, I just want to sort of backtrack through the fact that there was a thorough exercise done by De Beers to understand what the key challenges are in the diamond industry as a whole. Um, so I'll break them down a little bit so that you can really understand why there was a need to implement something like Tracer. Um, also on the produce and upstream side of the value chain, De Beers witnessed the inability for businesses to actually tell their in-country stories, their impact stories. Um, De Beers themselves have made a significant social and economic development um, contribution within the countries that they are operating in. And that's working with local partners to invest in the, in the health, the safety, the communities that operate in those jurisdictions. But they've also plugged into protecting the natural environment as well. And an example of that is their partnership with Peace Parks that's widely known around pioneering the Moving Giants Initiative. Now that is the longest and largest elephant translocation to have ever been attempted. Um, and then when we move to the midstream to understand the challenges there in the Diamond Valley chain, it's a very competitive landscape and businesses need to differentiate themselves. And often this is done using new technology. So that was one rationale over there. Not just that, but the financial institutions also need to validate the reasons and, and the risks that they're taking in financing the diamond industry as a whole. Um, and then when I move to what we're speaking about today, which is the consumer, uh, consumers want to know if their diamonds have been ethically and responsibly sourced, but more so, how can they actually verify that information? Um, it's for all these very reasons that De Beers Group decided to pay attention and embrace the consu consumer concerns as well as other stakeholders as well, but to maximize that positive impact um, of a journey of a diamond from the time it comes out of the ground to the retailer and then all the way to the end consumer. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, you talked about trust and we're going to talk about that more further on, but that idea of verification, that's very important and that feeds into the trust. So makes sense. So Yulia, aluminium is on the other side of the spectrum um, of diamonds. No offense, but no one's going to no one's going to make a movie out of it. And no one's not going to buy a window frame or buy a can of beans because the aluminum came from somewhere not nice um, or made in a not nice way. Um, but aluminum, as we most of us will know, is one of the most used metals in the world. And that's not changing anytime soon. Therefore, I would expect you've got a bit of a captured market and there's no need to differentiate whereas with diamonds you do need to differentiate so um but, but by the same token and n plus group recently committed to going net zero by 2050 can you introduce yourself and then let us know if this decision and other decisions were internally made or if there was a push from consumer groups or or your customers to make changes um, yeah, thank you, Ariana. Thank you for Women in Mining and uh, great to have this uh, conversation because I'm a strong believer that actually consumer is driving this world because we want to live in a better place as people. Um, yeah, one quote I would say to start with is that at some point aluminum, when it was only discovered, was more expensive than gold. So I don't, I'm not sure, like, you know, it's not worth a movie um, from a historical perspective. But let me start uh, by introducing myself. My name is Yulia Chikunaeva. I'm Director for Capital Markets and Strategic Initiatives at EM Plus Group. Before that, I'm a career banker, worked in Sparebank and Goldman Sachs. And in Goldman, I was part of the project that was developing GS Sustain, the ESG framework for evaluation of the emerging markets equities across the ESG criteria. And, uh, you know, sustainability, climate change is uh, very dear to my heart as a, as a person. Um, in the EM Plus uh, group is uh, pretty unique among the natural resources uh, companies, uh, you would ask why you're producing aluminum, the widest spread metal, as you said, uh, on Earth's crust. Well, we are the largest producer globally of uh, low carbon aluminum, and um, that's the 
mentality of the company. That's the way it was created. Um, we now see that we would be the essential building block of the fast, um, you know, of the fast emerging uh, low carbon economy. And also we are the world's largest private sector generator of uh, hydropower. So we are a major player in a global uh, clean energy tool. And, um, you know, as a result of this unique business combination, we have a not only the uh, competitive advantage of being lowest uh, cost producer of aluminium, but uh, actually, uh, you know, um, uh, driving since 2014 uh, the uh, the uh, effort to uh, to make consumers across the entire value chain um, you know aware about the low carbon aluminium and the importance of differentiation of materials uh, from uh, which end products are made so i think uh, this uh, announcement that you mentioned uh, just now um, that we announced the ambition to become net zero by 2050 and also as a key element to this uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 35 percent by 2030 that came natural uh, to us and uh, we believe that those stretching targets uh, represent the you know, the exact uh, culture of the company. And uh, we currently see that without setting the target, and we wholeheartedly believe in that, uh, you can't move forward. So you, you need to aspire to reach something and then maybe even outperform. Uh, so um, uh, the decision is a very logical step for us. Our rationale is uh, that not only um, that no industry uh, can remain competitive or be reliable supplier of the future or have a license to operate that Michelle uh, mentioned in her, uh, you know, opening remarks um, without addressing the challenge. Uh, climate uh, change issues. And indeed, we see the growing demand for low carbon aluminum across multiple sectors worldwide, not only because of the regulatory pressures, but because of the consumer pressures, including electronics, packaging, and such wholesale sectors as building and construction. Interest in low carbon aluminum is particularly prominent among automotive producers, um, you know, car manufacturers. They proactively look for the suppliers um, where um, they have, uh, you know, full scope emissions data. And that is one of the Ill elements of the sustainable uh, solution for the e-mobility, electric vehicles and the transition to the low carbon economy. On, on average, uh, OEM's greenhouse gas uh, reduction targets range between 25 to 30% by 2025 by, for some producers, for others by 2030. And most of them have committed to the um, uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. So I think we just, you know, uh, making a logical step to follow uh, the road that uh, consumer is paving for us. And more importantly, I think that if you look at the carbon trust research uh, conducted earlier this year, um, you know, 60% of consumers in UK uh, and uh, more than half in the US would like to see carbon labeling on products exactly as they are seeing calories. So I think that is a another drive that we need to uh, uh, to aspire uh, to aspire for. So we firmly believe that low carbon aluminium is uh, the right way forward. Uh, that's the core element of building back better, and um, we anticipate that the demand for it is going to go grow with a double digit pace in the next uh, five to ten years. So I think uh, that comes natural when you understand how it all goes. Great, thanks for that, Yulia. Um, I think that's a very good segue actually to the next question because you talk about stretch targets and as far as I'm concerned, it all sounds very ambitious, um, but you know, we, we do see companies like Anglo-American and N Plus Group, et cetera, doing these kinds of things, but is it enough and how can we in improve going forward? We're gonna go around the room and because Michelle is the closest to me, I, ch I choose her. <laughs> That's perfectly okay. Um, look, um, I don't. I don't really think it'll ever be enough because it's really not something that has a start date or an end date. It really needs to be a continuous process. Um, the continuous partnership, innovation, and, and when I say innovation, I mean it in the truest sense of the word: introducing completely new methods, investing in technology, collaborating across supply chains, 
Um, to your question around how can we improve, I think when it comes to low carbon metals and minerals in particular, the mining industry really needs to ask themselves, what role are we playing in achieving net zero? And that's been touched on by Yulia. What efforts are being put in place to, to make global decarbonization a top priority for the industry and, and globally? I mean, I can speak about Anglo-Americans efforts in this regard uh, for a bit. As, as one of the largest producers of platinum group metals, Anglo-American has taken an interest in the future of the role of the hydrogen economy and hydrogen technologies. We believe strongly in its potential in delivering these decarbonization solutions. And platinum is a vital component in hydrogen and fuel cell technology as well. Uh, the metal actually acts as a catalyst to produce um, hydrogen and turn that into electricity. And the only byproduct there is water. So just to speak a bit about that in terms of the efforts we've made, we've invested in venture focused research and startup companies. Um, internationally, we're a co-founder of the Hydrogen Council alongside other multinational companies as well. Um, I absolutely think collaboration is absolutely important and that's what we're trying to do here today. But we've recently helped bring industry partners together uh, to form the Aggregated Hydrogen Freight Consortium uh, in order to understand a bit more about what is needed to facilitate commercial volumes of hydrogen powered heavy goods vehicles into the UK. Um, I think lastly and then most importantly is we're facilitating the introduction of hydrogen across our own operations. Uh, we're currently piloting a fuel cell electric mine haul truck in my home country, South Africa, uh, with the goal to run on green hydrogen instead of diesel. Um, so just to sort of wrap that up, the, the collaboration, innovation, it's a continuous process. And I really don't think it's going to be enough if you're truly passionate about making improvements in this industry. Maybe we'll go Yulia, Charlie, Michelle. Uh, okay, um, I've, I totally uh, support what uh, Michele said, uh, and I think a lot of effort should be done uh, and directed towards collaboration and cross-sectoral collaboration. Uh, without these uh, alliances and um, cooperations, we would not be able to fast forward uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, low carbon economy. You know, we see great examples of cooperations within the industry and across the value chain. For example, Apple has committed to transitioning its entire manufacturing supply chain to 100% renewable electricity by 2030. That's a great commitment from the largest consumer good electronics, um, you know, uh, corporate. They, uh, you know, they are mining raw materials. Well, they require their suppliers in the supply chain to uh, mine raw materials in a sustainable way, and they communicate this directly to consumer. You know, for example, they have promoted the fact that uh, iPhone 12 uses 100% re uh, recyclable tungsten, uh, which is used for your vibrate, uh, you know, function on the Apple iPhone. So you don't know that, but uh, that's already there. Um, they, then. Um, iPhone case is made of low carbon aluminum um, and uh, they require a certific certificate for uh, for origin and uh, third party verification if you want to enter their supply chain. So I think from that standpoint, uh, that is uh, uh, that is very important. Uh, then, uh, you know, uh, the the other great example where consumer is leading the effort is uh, last year Super Bowl, uh, the biggest sporting event in the United States, and more than uh, 50,000 aluminum cups replaced the uh, plastic cups. I think uh, that's another uh, great example of sustainability, how uh, organizers can uh, can think about that. We also strongly believe that, uh, you know, one of the key elements is disclosure. Because if you have not measured something, you have not disclosed something, then you cannot set the target for yourself. And um, in our case, uh, we also lead a campaign uh, for the LME to introduce a greater disclosure of the carbon footprint of metals traded on, on the exchange. That would incentivize the new category creation because that's the largest liquid market um, on planet Earth, yes, for the, for the um, base metals, for example. And that would create the opportunity for the consumers, participants of LME to differentiate. And then I already mentioned that OEMs and automakers uh, reviewed their supply chains. And then they are imagining what they need to do to sell a car to Greta Thunberg, who is going to be 27 years old 
in 2030. So when you put that perspective into your head, just you, you, you have to think about those things. And we, as producers of the materials that are used in all of those magical, uh, you know, devices or um, uh, transportation means, we have to appreciate that fact. The world is changing. We should be changing. And uh, I agree with Michele, collaboration, uh, R&D, and, uh, you know, greater disclosure uh, would be the factors that uh, contribute to the faster change. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'd have to echo what both Michelle and Julia said. I, I totally agree. It, it's not enough. It'll probably never be enough. And, th and that's fine. That's, that's great because it has to be a continuous process. <laughs> I think um, what's really important is that with, with the growth of you know, ESG as a, as a concept put for in investors particularly, but also for consumers, this is in being driven by consumers and investors who, who are ultimately consumers. And uh, and that, that means that for a corporate miner, having a really progressive platform, both in sustainability and, uh, and everything else, actually becomes not only the right thing to do, it becomes the most profitable thing to do as well, because having more enhanced credentials than your competitors in this, in this space is starting to pay. Um, and my final, my final point I'd make on, on that is I think it's, it's easy to... To, to sort of let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good to some extent. And I think um, you, you can't get everything right on day one as long as you're constantly moving in, a, in the right direction and trying to improve every aspect, um, that's, that's good. It's always challenging to be the last one in a group around the, uh, the panel because you're simply sort of left agreeing with what has been said before. But I certainly support the, the statement that, you know, it's, it's never enough um, and that's a good thing. Um, collaboration is essential for us to be able to move forward. So, so is innovation. So is really the leadership that we're seeing even just by the companies and the initiatives on this panel, right? So that, that's fantastic. I do maybe just wanna, you know, take almost a, a little bit of a step back. We've straight went into the low carbon decarbonization aspect um, but it's ESG there's a social under governance side as well and I actually think one of the things we need to be mindful of is that we don't forget the other aspects that we equally have started working on or still need to work on really and you know human rights due diligence has been a concept that's been around for very long we're still struggling to implement it in many mineral supply chains it's still unfortunately a new concept for some metals um, in terms of what does it mean to do due diligence on human rights abuses in your supply chain how do you do that effectively um, and so i think to me one of the important points that we can improve going forward is just to make sure we while we have that fantastic leadership in place and while we have this innovation make sure we don't forget the rest of the industry make sure we don't run off with leaders and just sort of expect things to, to, to expand to the rest of the industry, expect things to be adopted by the rest of the industry. It's, it's a lot of legwork. It's a lot of day-to-day of -day work to raise awareness of these concepts, to explain them to maybe smaller companies, particularly companies that operate um, or are operated or owned by more, more vulnerable um, communities by minorities that have maybe a, a, a more of need of capacity building or, or awareness raising. And I think we're gonna talk about that in, in the context of artisanal mining in more detail. Um, but, but I think that, that the importance of making sure what we do is inclusive, it's accessible, it doesn't exclude actors in the value chain unintentionally um, so, and, and make sure that we're not just sort of dropping our efforts on one side just because there's a new priority that we've all agreed is, is essential and we need to focus on but that doesn't mean that the work is done on the other aspects and, and so I think sometimes we in the industry um, have, have a tendency almost of being a little bit short-sighted in that sense and it's important for us to to make sure that we keep we keep doing the legwork as well we keep doing that background work we keep doing the everyday work and, and we keep convincing other members of the industry that may have less incentives, that may be less exposed to some of these pressures um, to do the same. Fantastic, thank you everyone. Um, Michelle, you made, you may have been the last person, but you made some excellent um, yeah, points. And the idea, it's such a long, you know, when we build mines or infrastructure for mines, it's for decades, if not 
a century. And um, yeah, but we, we do have a habit of being short-sighted. Um, and the idea of collaboration, not just among companies within or organizations within the industry, but beyond. So kind of like what we're talking about, the consumers with the manufacturers. Um, you also, Michelle, segued very nicely into my next question, um, which is Michelle A with her diamond hat on and Charlie, and it's about artisanal and small scale miners, uh, a very important topic for the industry. So how has this consumer driven demand for more sustainable materials um, impacted small scale miners? In some ways, it seems to lend itself to the formalization um, and the embracing of the industry by, by large scale miners, but on the other, it feels like they're being further marginalized. Uh, so maybe we'll, we'll start with Charlie first. Absolutely. Um, look, it's a, it's a, it's a complex um, question. I can only really talk about the, the gold industry because that's, that's what I know. Um, but within, within Gold, you've oh, um, artisanal and small scale mining probably accounts for something like 10% of global production. And it's incredibly important that that plays part of, of the picture, but it's never going to be a, a mass market solution. So, from my perspective, within the jewelry industry, we have, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of really fantastic organizations, Fair Trade and Fair Mind. And their approach is to charge a premium for the metal, which gets reinvested into in, ensuring that artisanal mine can be produced in a way that avoids some of the horrendous sort of health and safety issues and social issues and environmental issues that can be associated with ASM mining. Um, that's not enough in itself. So what we think we also need to do is look at corporate miners and how we can leverage their balance sheets to actually help with this, this issue as well. So actually, if you have a, a well-run corporate that's properly engaging with its, with its local communities, in terms of um, both you know, training and engaging with locals, but also proper alternative li livelihood programs. Um, that, that helps as well. The, the, in the gold industry, the third part of that would be a sort of using recycling within the supply chain as well. So it's, you need to have a bit of everything. It, it has to be balanced out. But I would say raising awareness of, of provenance um, and where metals came from definitely doesn't further marginalize um, ASM, I think it, it raises those issues and it encourages consumer engagement with those issues, which is which is good. Look, very different um, commodity, but very same sentiments as Charlie, actually. Um, I'm going to put my diamond industry hat back on. Uh, there's something like 150 million people dependent on artisanal and small scale mining globally. And so, as, as Charlie's also mentioned, so putting a stop to ASM is absolutely not a sustainable option at all. Um, the industry should be investing in programs to formalize the sector, to make the practices a lot more safer, um, to bring back that trust and credibility. And I'll always go back to the trust factor, um, but that needs to be brought back to the sector. And also then promoting if the mineral has been ethically sourced. Um, so an example that I can think of is, you know, in 2018, De Beers launched their GemFair program. Um, it is a program that is creating a secure and transparent route to market for ethically sourced ASM diamonds from Sierra Leone. Um, and they've taken two, two approaches to this. The one is creating a digital record of the diamonds that are actually found and registered at that mine site. Um, and it includes using an application, having an on-site tablet, um, but also collaborating with the tracer program and process that I've just spoken about. Um, the second approach that De Beers have gone is on a global scale, rolling out a set of artisanal and small scale mining sourcing guidelines. And those are aligned with the OECD as well. Those are guidelines related to labor practices, human rights, um, environmental safety impact along others. And, and it goes back to Michelle's point on not missing out on the fact of the, the human rights and labor practices, which we are a long way from. Um, I really, really think that it is around changing the narrative about ASM. Um, being able to show where the diamonds are coming from and, and the fact that there's been positive benefits to that country that it is coming from. So I do believe programs like Gem Fair, um, like Charlie's mentioned as well, um, do have the potential to change the sector as a whole. Uh, on a more personal front, I believe that the additional challenge that the industry needs to try and take on and zoom in on a little bit more is women in the ASM sector. Uh, women in the ASM sector in certain jurisdictions face 
very different, different economic challenges as a result of lack of access. So it's access and control to finances, to licenses, um, to, to any sorts of resources. And one of the most important resource, and it's becoming a great commodity, is data. And with that lack of access, it leaves women vulnerable in the ASM sector. And I do think that there is scope for the industry to step up um, and to empower women in ASM. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle, I was just talking to a journalist at The Economist actually about this and actually the impact women have on ASM. They, they make it safer, better um, for, for everyone in it. So yeah, very good point. So let's move on to Michelle and Yulia and Michelle's gonna go first. <laughs> Can you tell us how involved the base metal companies are in the supply chain? Yeah, so it's a very broad question. Um, and I, I think, again, we've, we've already touched upon a lot of these aspects around collaboration and the need to work both up and down the supply chain and across different industries, which, which we definitely observe um, in the base metals as well. Look, I think base metals have maybe been, some of them have maybe been less exposed to, like I said, the kind of pressure, right? There was no blood diamonds for copper either. Um, there was no regulation for copper um, so far. So the, the pressure has been maybe a little different um, or maybe a little slower. Um, so what we're seeing today now is, is the starting of the conversation, particularly at the both ends of the value chain, right? I think a lot of the times we skip the middle and the dialogue is really held between the brands on the one hand side and the large mining companies on the other hand side. But even there, you know, we're still facing a lot of the a lot of these um, points that are, are being raised around audit fatigue, around additional burden for reporting, around, you know, do we need to have 50 different Excel questionnaires to ask the same questions? Could we just have one, please? You know, do you need to have 10 different reporting timelines? Could we just have one, please? We're, you know, producing these sustainability reports. Why aren't they being used? Why aren't they being read? Um, so coming back to actually Michelle's point about the data, right? There's so much data out there now, the question I think is really, and the, the benefit of, of the engagement along the value chain and across industries is what, what do we do with that data, right? Where does the data sit? Is it actually helpful? Does it actually inform better practices? Does it inform purchasing decisions? Does it inform investment decisions? Um, and so I think that's where a lot of the conversation needs to still happen um, at a collective level in terms of driving change that we're looking for and making sure to support that argument of, disclosure and transparency, making sure that what we disclose and what we provide in terms of data is, is actually not just out there, but, but really informs the, the changes that we're looking for. I, I would add just one quick last item on the collaboration thing. And, and again, sort of coming back to my earlier point of the need not to, of the need to keep working at these things. One of the benefits of engaging along the supply chain is the ability to build trust and to build relationships and with that a willingness to stay engaged. And I think that's so important when we're talking about companies that are genuinely trying to do the right thing, but they may be early on in their stages. They, they may not be perfect. They may be far from perfect. Um, companies that are operating in challenging situations, in challenging circumstances, it's so important to be able to build that trust and relationship to say, well, we're as a consumer, as a customer, I will remain here as long as there is improvement, as long as we both agreed what needs to get better and we have timelines in place and milestones and you know you measure your progress towards those goals, but we will not be gone two years from now. Um, and I think that builds a really solid foundation to justify investments at any point in the supply chain really um, to stay engaged in those areas where we need change most to happen. Okay, now I'm in challenging situation because I agree with everything that people said. Um, let me let me like try to give a little bit of a different spin. Uh, I think we touched upon on many aspects of the supply chain towards the end consumer, but let's look at the mining supply chain. Okay, so mining itself is a part of the upstream supply chain. So, for example, for us. To achieve uh, a commitment to reduce um, uh, our carbon emissions by 35% by 2030 or reaching net zero by 2050 would involve the whole value chain for mining, yes? So from initial bauxite mining through aluminum uh, refining to um, final smelting with all of the elements of decarbonization of this chain 
through, first of all, sources of energy, then using the uh, sustainable uh, low carbon uh, transportation. Yes. And uh, in many cases, uh, we need to have a technological breakthrough. So one of the elements where we need a technological breakthrough, and uh, I actually following the Anglo-American uh, project on the uh, retrofitting the hydrogen cells into the mining equipment, because I think that's that's very interesting. Um, and based on this example, we can all learn as an industry. Uh, so that's, that's one of the examples, yes, uh, how you can improve on the carbon footprint. Then we are part of the United Nations uh, Global Compact Initiative and one of the companies that signed the uh, the uh, statement of the global uh, compact uh, with Maersk. Maersk is the largest cargo uh, operator globally. They need to decarbonize uh, their fleet uh, and therefore we all will benefit. But then at some point, uh, you know, uh, from, from, uh, from the standpoint of the consumer, when the scope three is going to be fully transparent and uh, measurable, I think, um, I think um, uh, everyone would benefit and, uh, and that is the the whole new uh, new world and i think that only brings me back to the point of greater transparency that is required across the entire value chain it is it doesn't matter are you mining bauxite uh, using the shovel or are you you know uh, prospecting uh, at artisanal mine um, uh, you know with diamonds or gold um that is, uh, that is uh, this, this transparency at the end of the day and understanding of what you are doing and how you are doing it, I think uh, is a key for the industry to move forward. And therefore, um, I think consumers at the far end of the, of the, of the spectrum uh, would benefit disproportionately from, uh, from that transparency. Um, yes, um, some industries in mining already in a more advanced stage to, for example, to implement blockchain as, a, as, a, as an instrument to uh, trace the, uh, the, um, uh, the sustainability of their end product. Others are in a less advanced stage. But at the end of the day, I think we're all moving to the, uh, to the scenario where label on the product on the shelf in a in a supermarket may at some point uh, have a carbon footprint up, apart from the calories count um, and we trying to promote this through collaboration and partnership for example if we get back to the like middle of the chain that sometimes gets overlooked um, we uh, earlier this year our metals uh, segment uh, um, announced the partnership with Hodaka. Uh, that is the um, uh, midstream producer of high quality billets and precision extrusion. Um, they uh, pro uh, they are the supplier to top quality aluminum alloys for sporting goods, consumer electronics, automotive industry, and motorcycle parts. So the low carbon aluminum. Uh, that we supply that is fully certified to Hodaka allows them then to stay in a close collaboration from the standpoint of their product development to their uh, to their consumers that are producers of sort of all sorts of the consumer goods and then you know and they will be able to meet the uh, end user demand for trans transparency and eco friendliness so you know um, uh, when we are all you know, united and transparent about what we do, we then move, you know, faster. And I think there is, as we already said many times, uh, there is only so much we can do in the in a given day, but I think we all keep doing it. Thank you. Um, and I'll pass it on to Iman to do the, give the instructions for the breakout rooms. That's the end of the panel. <laughs> Thank you, Ariadna. Uh, once I press the assign tab, you will leave this view and enter your designated room. Each room will host between four to five attendees for about five minutes. We'll give you a minute warning before we bring you back into the main room and you'll get the most of your networking, get the most out of your networking room if you're able to keep your cameras on. So please don't be shy, introduce yourselves. And then after this networking opportunity, we will go back and answer some of your questions. While you're in the breakout room, you may wish to discuss the impact consumers have had on our industry. And with that, if you're all ready, I'm going to press the assign tab now.
thank you for doing the breakout rooms. Um, now we're going to do the Q&A session. Um, and the, the first question I, I think can be answered by everyone. Um, so here we are working hard to be better, uh, yet let's be honest, the mining uh, industry still has a tarnished reputation. Do you believe the work that you have been doing um, is being noticed by people outside of the industry? Um, and has it remedied misconceptions about our role and our value to society? And by, by our, I mean the mining industry. Um, or does it actually make things worse because we're, we're pointing fingers at ourselves? Maybe Yulia, you would like to go first? Well, that's a huge question, Mariadna. Um, I think we are in early stages of, the, uh, of our work. I think we, we're definitely progressing somewhere. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that, let me give it an example on investors, okay? That's like a financial markets part. Um, whatever we were going as a corporate to see our investors, like our shareholders and investors that are simply looking after the uh, uh, mining sector um, on a roadshow, say 24 months ago, maybe every fifth one would have asked us, what is your target? What are you doing? How is it like um, you're thinking about that? This year, like not this year, last year, especially through the summer months. I think when everybody kind of uh, among the portfolio managers sorted out their panic about the financial markets volatility, they actually started like every single question was super focused about the ESG. And not only about E, but as Michelle said about uh, S and about G and how they all work between themselves and what we're doing and why we're doing that. So I think from the standpoint of the reaction of the external audiences, we do have the reaction, we do get positive feedbacks. However, I think we need to engage more. And I think we need to engage and educate uh, consumer more, because then consumer would be, uh, you know, more aware and self aware. And um, that would create further pressure and aspiration and motivation for everyone in the supply chain to change. That would be my kind of two cents on that. Maybe Michele can follow up. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I will go next on that one. Look, I, I absolutely believe that we, we are 100% being seen and the good work is being seen. Um, it's being noticed by civil society, NGOs, governments and other adjacent sectors as well. Uh, probably a recent example on our side is Anglo-American was recently featured in SMP's Sustainability Yearbook. Um, we took part in their assessment last year. And it's quite a proud moment because you need to be in the top performing 15% of your industry or so. Um, but apart from the public assessments and the ratings agencies, we cannot underestimate the role of social media um, and how it has transformed our world, especially now in a pandemic, um, even more so during a pandemic. Uh, the speed and not necessarily the accuracy of information but definitely the speed of access to information is absolutely incredible and if there's any business that doesn't see that as an opportunity then they're missing out on the opportunity to connect with the consumer um, a particular example on my side is i sit on a, a number of associations and we're actively involved in hydrogen associations but the key theme that keeps coming out of that um, is driving awareness and education about hydrogen's role in the clean energy transition. And this, the way that we're doing this is through media, media campaigns and activations. So it's just leveraging that form of communication to actually tell our side of the story about mining to the consumers out there as well. Maybe if, I, if I could jump, jump in there just quickly, I think um, you know, from our point of view, Absolutely, the, the whole one of the main reasons behind single mine origin is to address those misconceptions, and we're definitely seeing it. I mean, just last week we had a, um, a New York jeweler, jeweler Jamil Mohammed, who's, which is Kyrie Range. Um, Amanda Gorman was wearing a piece of his jewelry on the cover of Time magazine. I was talked about in, in Vogue last week as well, and we're providing you know QR co codes for that gold. To be traceable and linked directly back to a to a corporate and a raise awareness of what that corporate is doing in the local community 
right through to to the consumer. So you're 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 seeing a, a degree of engagement between the consumer all the way down the supply chain that I, I think is you know very difficult to to achieve. I'm going to take the last spot in this round then here. Um, and I, I would echo this. I think it's definitely noticed and and you know it's it's definitely also seen. Um, the efforts are being seen and and recognized. Um, I, I would add maybe to the points that were raised before, you know, one, one thing is, is to make sure that the efforts we do are translated into simple, clear, visible ways of communicating, right? If, if, if I have to explain what I do in my day job, I say, well, uh, you know, FSC paper or MSC fish that you see in your grocery store. We're not there yet with metals, right? But I think we as, as the industry also need to make sure that we communicate in the simple, concise way. It goes to Michelet's point about social media. We can't put 100 page reports out there and expect the consumer to care. But we can work, to Julia's point, on a label that has a specific piece of information. We can put a logo on a product. We can find easier, simpler ways to communicate what good practices are. And of course that means the whole system has to be behind that logo to ensure practices are actually good um, and the logo holds what it promises. But I think that's the part where we maybe need to improve on is, is to make sure we translate all this work into something that's easily recognizable and understood by the consumer rather than trying to get lost in all this wealth of, of great stuff and great things that we do, but that we just struggle to, to communicate in a simple way. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, communication is key. Uh, we're gonna end with that one question. Apologies, we couldn't get to the others. We have a hard stop at 5 p.m. So I'll now pass it on to Amy. Um, well, first of all, sorry, thank you to the panelists and thank you to all the attendees for, for joining us today. Uh, I'll pass it now to Amy for the closing remarks. Thank you, Adriana, and thank you again to all of our speakers for uh, being part of today's event. And of course, Buchanan from all the their support. Um, if this is your first time joining one of our events, Women in Mining is a volunteer-run non-profit organisation which promotes the um, employment, retention and progress of women in the mining industry and everyone is welcome to become a member of WIM UK regardless of gender or where you're located. So please go to our website, um, membership is free and we would also love it if you could join us for our next event which is on the uh, 24th of March at 4pm GMT time which is actually being run by our membership committee on career opportunities in the mining industry. Um, and for all the details and to register similarly, go to the WIM UK website. So again, thank you to everyone, our speakers and participants for joining us today and wishing you all um, a wonderful rest of your day. Hopefully see you soon. <laughs>